Thank you for doing that. That will save us. Oh my time. goodness, of course. I'm going to check on another. Let talk to this. All right. So we're right. going to go ahead and get started. And I think, get started. I think Dr. Ellis, if you could just mute your line, I think there might be some echoing there. I'm muted. Thank you. All right. Well, um, welcome to everyone joining today for our October webinar. Um, today, we kick off our clinical education series to support our new initiative, Cardiac Conditions and Obstetrical Care. And um, today's presentation is going to serve as the lecture number one of our education series, and we're going to be focusing on cardiac physiology. Uh, but just before we get started, if everyone would just please mute their lines. We're going to open up for Q&A after the presentation, but uh, absolutely feel free to enter your questions into the chat at any time. Um, if we don't get to questions, we can certainly get those uh, responses out after. Um, and the presentation and recording will be available shortly after today's presentation. So just a few updates before we get started. We actually have an additional learning event that's going to be bright and early tomorrow, um, October 5th at 8 a.m. And the topic will be cardiovascular disease related maternal mortality. And this is for the Emory Grand Round session. And Dr. Afshan Hamid, who spoke at our March um, GAPQC um, webinar, will be speaking for that. She'll be the featured speaker. So please, um, I did send out a flyer last week uh, mid last week, um, and I will send that out with the notes today, uh, with the presentation today. Um, and if you don't receive that, you want to attend, just let me know and I can forward that um, information along. Um, our next paternal webinar will be the lecture two um, for the cardiac series and the topic or tentative topic will be cardiac warning signs. Um, and the speaker will be uh, Dr. Natalie Politov. Um, and then for our hypertension teams joining today, our quarter three 2022 data submission, that it will be due at the end of this month. Um, and you all will be able to report for the existing metrics, so the ones that you've been reporting on for the last year or so prior to the last update, or you'll have the option to uh, report the new metrics that we reviewed at the last webinar um, last month. Um, so you'll have a choice to do that depending on your system readiness for those metrics. So just for clarity on that. Um, and then we are following the, we are using a new um, platform for data submission. That's going to be survey one, two, three and the Esri platform. And so we plan to get some more information and instructions out to you all shortly on um, how to go about doing that and submitting that through that link. Um, we are actively recruiting for the cardiac initiative. Our hope is to continue open enrollment for wave one through October. We know this is a um, sort of multidisciplinary bundle. Uh, we know that getting the right folks at the table is super important. And so we wanted to keep, you know, kind of extend this enrollment period from the summer through October. Um, so if you are interested, please do um, sign up for that. Um, for our teams that have already enrolled, we're going to be scheduling our onboarding calls. Um, we wanted to wait with uh, getting some information from our national AIM team. There's a change packet that's available, so we wanted to provide all of our teams uh, with that before um, getting on that onboarding call so that you have some materials to review. So please look out for those emails in the next week or so. Um, and then our first data submission for cardiac will be for quarter four, um, October through December, and that will be due January 31st. And of course, more information will be coming out about that. Um, and as many of you know on here, as part of this work group that we've been working on for the cardiac initiative, we would like to put together a cardiac network, referral network, um, a statewide network re resource um, for everyone. And so we have asked our teams to complete the survey, just completing, um, you know what you what you know from your cardiac referral network it may require you to reach out um, if you don't know some of the information about your referral network but we really encourage you all to complete that um, it's a really um, great uh, product that we're looking to to put together so thank you i think we have over 20 people that completed it so far 20 facilities so um, please 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 get your um, entries in there um, we really appreciate that and um, today, um, all the GAPQC cardiac lecture series, um, including the cardiac physiology today discussion, um, is really created to support the key education elements of the um, cardiac conditions bundle. Um, there's uh, process measures that really focus on education for clinicians, um, including ED, 
um, clinicians and nurses. So um, this is really an awesome opportunity for you all to get some um, formative education on some of the stuff um, to support the bundle. Um, and so for those facilities that have not enrolled yet, you can scan this QR code with the dinosaur in it. Um, it'll take you directly to our website where you can download and complete the um, enrollment form for the cardiac initiative. I am not going to go into this um, in full. I just wanted to let everybody know that our goal for this initiative is to reduce severe mor morbidity and mortality related to maternal cardiac conditions in Georgia. And our SMART aim is by February 6, 2026, National Wear, Wear Red Day, to reduce harm related to existing and pregnancy-related cardiac conditions through the fourth trimester by 20%. And um, we would be nowhere without our cardiac work group that's been meeting for the last year. Um, it's a multidisciplinary work group. Um, very um, grateful for the time allotted to planning for this initiative. Um, but from this work group, four subgroups were created to focus on products that are going to support this bundle, support you all in the field doing this work and implementing this bundle. And so I'm not going to go through all of this. But um, with the four subgroups, we have four listed here and the work, prog uh, work products underneath them. Today, we're going to be focusing on our clinician and patient education plan. Um, our work product is really building out the education plans for, for, for clinicians and for patients. So I'm um, going to just talk a little bit about our education planning and progress here. Um, this is a tentative schedule, but education is currently planned through June 2023 to really support those foundational cardiac education needs. Um, again, this is a tentative schedule. We're working with speakers for the dates um, and, and kind of aligning with that for availability. Um, and the subgroups are working on creating education resources for patients as well. So we're looking at a patient self-screening tool and education around cardiac warning signs. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Ellis, our fearless leader, um, to highlight our GAP QC clinician education champion, who's been working hard to plan and coordinate our education. And then we'll, we'll do an introduction to our wonderful speaker today. So Dr. Ellis, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, I cannot, yeah, I've got an echo. Can you hear that? Can you hear an echo? It's better. Okay, all right. Uh, and my camera doesn't seem to be working, but trust me, I'm here. Uh, so good afternoon and welcome everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Irish Krishna, who will in turn introduce our speaker for the session, Dr. Carolyn Duty. Dr. Krishna did her OBGYN residency and MFM fellowship at Emory and is now an attending physician over at Emory Midtown. She's actively involved in patient care, teaching and leadership roles at Midtown. She works closely with the adult, uh, Emory Adult Congenital Heart Center and is the maternal fetal medicine lead for the management of pregnant women with congenital cardiac disease. This uh, heart center is an internationally recognized cardiology service that specializes in the care of adults with congenital heart defects. It has one of the highest patient volumes in the country and thus one of the highest obstetric volumes. In this role, Dr. Krishna coordinates the multidisciplinary care for pregnant persons referred throughout the state of Georgia who have congenital heart disease. Her multidisciplinary team includes congenital cardiology, obstetrics, MFM, anesthesia, neonatology, and the nursing staff, just to name a few. As the director of perinatal quality, Dr. Krishna has also had experience developing evidence-based protocols and implementing educational lecture series to improve the quality of care for high-risk women. She and Dr. Duty uh, willingly, which means no arm twisting, uh, volunteered to work with GAP QC to put together a curriculum of lectures to keep our providers across the state up to date on key issues related to cardiac conditions during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. We sincerely appreciate their willingness to undertake this task, and we're looking forward to Dr. Duty's lecture today. So with that, Dr. Krishna, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellis, for that warm introduction. Um, I'm very excited to present Dr. Carolyn Duty. She's a close friend and colleague of mine. Um, Dr. Duty um, obtained her PhD from Cambridge University. She obtained her MD from the University of Wisconsin and did her residency in OBGYN at Duke and her MFM fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. She became interested in um, cardiac patients from um, just practicing in Philadelphia because that is another center where they see a lot of uh, cardiac patients and high-risk women with cardiac conditions. And so um, I've seen her present this lecture a 
a few times and I feel like every time I learn something new, it's a very um, exciting lecture. So I'm looking forward to it. So I would hope you will learn a lot of things from Dr. Judy today. Okay, so can you all hear me? Okay, great. So I would like to thank um, Lisa Ailey and the Department of Georgia um, Public Health for the opportunity to speak today. Um, all right, so next slide. Unfortunately, we couldn't get it to work, so I'm gonna to have to say next every time the slide needs to advance. There we go. So the objectives of my talk today are as follows. So first, I plan to review the relevant changes in cardiovascular physiology that occur during pregnancy and to show how these changes put pregnant persons at an increased risk for cardiac events during pregnancy. Second, I will provide a brief review of the main risk stratification systems used to help counsel cardiac patients and some of the limitations of these stratification systems. Third, I hope to demonstrate how an understanding of the changes in cardiovascular physiology can provide a practical framework for counseling patients and some general pearls on pregnancy management. And finally, since I think we all learn best when knowledge is put into context, I will try to put all of this review into context with at least one clinical case and hopefully demonstrate to you how a sound understanding of physiology can help manage patients with abnormal cardiac function. Okay. So next. Um, so first things first, as we learned way back in nursing or medical school, it all starts with physiology. So next. So I both love and hate this slide because it's so busy, but it does nicely summarize the main changes in the cardiovascular system that occur during pregnancy. Namely, that blood volume increases, heart rate increases, the cardiac silhouette enlarges, a physiologic murmur develops, and almost all pregnant persons will develop a pseudoanemia. It's worth noting that these cardiovascular and hemodynamic changes in pregnancy begin as early as the fourth week of gestation and persist for several months postpartum, sometimes even up to a year postpartum. Okay, next. The majority of the changes we will be discussing are physiologic or functional changes, although it is worth mentioning that there are some structural changes that also occur. Due to the volume increase that occurs during pregnancy, which we will discuss in more detail in a minute, the left ventricular and diastolic volume of the heart increases by about 10%, while the right and left ventricular mass increase by approximately 40 and 50% respectively. The changes in systolic function as measured by ejection fraction are less clear. In some patients, it will remain the same, while in others, it will actually decrease. However, up to 20% of patients will have some degree of diastolic dysfunction, which may be one contributing factor to the dyspnea on exertion felt by many pregnant people. These structural changes will return to baseline by approximately one year postpartum. While these structural changes are profound, I would now like to review some of the physiologic changes that impart, impact heart function during pregnancy. So next. So first off, let's discuss cardiac output and how that parameter changes during pregnancy. So cardiac output is defined as the amount of blood the heart pumps in one minute and is usually measured in liters per minute. During pregnancy, cardiac output increases significantly in order to keep up with the increasing metabolic demands of perfusing both mother and fetus. These changes start early in pregnancy and continue throughout the third trimester with output increasing to a peak of 30 to 50% above preconception levels. About half this increase will occur by eight weeks gestation, which is why some cardiac patients will decompensate even within the first month or two of pregnancy, since already their, their heart will be coping with more volume. Multiple gestations will increase this output yet further, and multiparous women will see greater increases as compared to their nulliparous counterparts. But why does pregnancy cause cardiac output to increase so much? The answer may be found in the equation for cardiac output, which shows cardiac output is a product of stroke volume times heart rate. And if cardiac output increases, it follows that one or both parameters must also increase. We'll start with stroke volume on the right, or actually on the left there, which you can see is influenced by both blood volume and vascular resistance. Okay, next. All right. So stroke volume is the amount of blood pushed forward by each contraction of the heart and may also be referred to as preload. Stroke volume or plasma volume um, increases throughout pregnancy and is mainly driven by an increase in plasma volume. The increase in positive volume is thought to be mediated by the estrogen stimulation of the reno angiotensin aldosterone system, which leads to increased retention of both sodium and water, which in turn leads to increased plasma volume. The increase can be significant, up to 45 to 50% over pre-pregnancy values, which equates to about 1,200 to 1,600 milliliters, and peaks at 28 to 32 weeks, 
which will become important when we get to the portion on patient counseling. This increase in plasma volume also explains two other phenomena seen in pregnancy, the increase in blood, volume, blood pressure in the late second and early third trimester and the anemia or pseudoanemia of pregnancy. The explanation for the increase in blood pressure is straightforward. As there is more volume, there is more pressure, um, which explains why many chronic hypertensive patients develop worsening blood pressures around 28 to 32 weeks. The pseudoanemia or hemodilution is a little bit more complicated because it's not just that pregnant people have fewer red blood cells, and in fact, they have more. It's just that the red cells they do have are diluted in more volume. Okay, next. As I mentioned, um, red blood cell mass increases during pregnancy up to 250 mLs to 450 mLs or by 20 to 30%, which likely occurs due to a hormone mediated increase in erythropoiesis. This increase in erythropoiesis in turn places demands on maternal iron stores with total increased iron requirement averaging around 1,000 milligrams over the course of a pregnancy. It's also worth mentioning that the content of the red blood cells also changes um, as erythrocyte 2,3 dysphosphoglycerate concentration increases in pregnancy, which lowers the affinity of maternal hemoglobin for oxygen, helping therefore have the oxygen transfer to the fetus. However, despite this increase um, in um, red blood cell mass, plasma volume still increases more, and so you see a physiologic hemodilution or pseudoanemia in the early third trimester. This may have a protective effect by decreasing blood viscosity to counteract the predisposition to thromboembolic events, but that is still somewhat theoretical. All right, next slide. So while the increased stroke volume is mostly driven by the expansion of the plasma volume, it is important to note that pregnancy also affects vascular resistance or the load the heart must push against in order to push the blood forward, which is why it's often referred to afterload. Pregnancy decreases systemic vascular resistance, a phenomenon which is attributed to a combination of gestational hormones and increased nitrous oxide production. Many textbooks will implicate progesterone-mediated smooth muscle relax relaxation, although the reality is this exact mechanism for the fall in systemic vascular relaxation is poorly understood. However it happens, though, this decrease in systemic resistance runs, um, results in decreased mean arterial pressure, which in turn activates the renin angiotensin aldosterone system to increase sodium retention in order to preserve intravascular volume, which leads back to more plasma expansion. This the decrease in uh, mean arterial pressure is most noticeable at the mid-trimester mark, which explains why many women maybe need to take an off their antihypertensives at this point in pregnancy, but then as we previously discussed, we need them back again at 32 weeks when the volume is at its peak. It also helps explain why many women experience postural hypotension or syncope in early pregnancy, a combination of low blood pressure made worse by dehydration, nausea, and vomiting. Next slide. But now that we've reviewed the factors that lead to increased stroke volume, let's focus on the other variable of cardiac output, heart rate. So next. Heart rate starts to increase in the first trimester and slowly rises throughout pregnancy, peaking at 15 to 20% above baseline in the third trimester. This increase is likely hormonally mediated and may be a physiologic response, similar to the increase in stroke volume that occurs in response to decreased vascular resistance. However, it's important to note that while mild tachycardia is normal, more, research out of, more recent research out of California suggests that even a resting pulse in the 110s is abnormal and should warrant a non-emergent cardiac workout. Now, next. This is a table taken from the ACOG practice bulletin number 212, pregnancy and heart disease, and summarizes the changes we just reviewed. As we've discussed, cardiac output, heart rate, and plasma volume all start increasing in the first trimester and continue increasing throughout pregnancy, while blood pressure initially decreases and then starts increasing in the early third trimester, peaking again at 28 to 32 weeks. Okay, next. Keep going, all right. Okay, so, but what happens in labor? Labor presents a unique physiologic challenge, and so it's worth exploring what happens there in a little more detail. During labor, cardiac output increases even more due to a variety of factors. Each contraction increases venous return to the heart, which results in an autotransfusion of approximately 200 to 300 cc's per contraction, leading to an increase in stroke volume or preload. Additionally, heart rate may also play a role and may be increased secondary to the catecholamine surge caused by pain or anxiety and medications we like to use like terbutaline, 
The result is that by the end of the first stage of labor, the cardiac output seen by the heart during contractions is 51% above the baseline term pregnancy values, which is already higher than a non-pregnant person. As we will talk about later, an epidural can decrease some of this rise in cardiac output by mitigating the increase in heart rate secondary to pain, but the autotransfusion effect of contractions will persist. Okay, next. So let's pause for a minute and think about epidural placement in the first stage of labor can impact cardiac output. In general, regional neuroaxial anesthesia is desirable in cardiac patients because these approaches provide excellent analgesia that can be titrated. And as we discussed on the previous slide, in high-risk cardiac patients, neuroaxial anesthesia can provide a reduction in cardiac output by decreasing the catecholamine release associated with pain and anxiety of labor. Additionally, neuroaxial anesthesia can decrease myocardial oxygen consumption associated with labor and will provide appropriate anesthesia for a passive second stage. But what are the downsides of regional anesthesia? Mainly that too much drop in cardiac output can be lethal to preload dependent lesions because when preload drops precipitously, cardiac output drops precipitously, leading to myocardial ischemia, which can lead to any, <laughs> any number of cardiac events, including an MI, ventricular arrhythmia, and or cardiovascular collapse. Not good. So for those reasons, epidurals are usually placed slowly with lower doses of anesthetics and single shot spinals are avoided even in planned cesarean deliveries. So we often say you want your epidurals low and slow for that reason. All right, next slide. So as anyone who works on L&D knows, hypotension is bad for uterine perfusion because it will lead to fetal bradycardia. And while epidurals are often the cause of hypotension, the supine position also contributes because when a pregnant person is supine, the IVC is compressed, which causes a significant drop in venous return, which then, then lead to a 25 to 30% drop in cardiac output. That is why whenever we see a fetal heart rate deceleration, we immediately rush to place the patient in left lateral decubitus position to try to quickly bring up cardiac output and improve fetal perfusion. This is also the reason why left lateral uterine displacement is important if doing CPR in a pregnant person and why we need to be especially careful while placing patients who are preload dependent in the, cardi in the supine position for prolonged periods of time, either for cervical exams, when we're trying to get the Foley in, those kinds of things. All right, next. In the second stage of labor, Valsalva is another maneuver that can lead to a drop in preload, as when someone Valsalvas, it increases the intrathoracic pressure, which in turn decreases venous return and thus preload. So again, you may be sensing a theme. This is why patients with preload-dependent lesions are encouraged to have an assisted second stage in order to de decrease the amount of Valsalva. Next. However, <laughs> if we've been worried about decreasing preload, as soon as delivery occurs, cardiac output immediately increases 60 to 80 percent due to an autotransfusion from release of cavo compression and blood from the contracted uterus. The sudden increase in cardiac output may overwhelm an already compromised heart and then may lead to arrhythmias or flash pulmonary edema in the immediate postpartum period. Next. While that sudden increase in cardiac output that comes immediately postpartum is transient, it is worth remembering that postpartum patients will continue to have fluid shifts throughout the first one to two weeks postpartum, and that these fluid shifts tend to be more significant in postoperative patients. Um, unfortunately, these fluid shifts tend to peak around day three to six after delivery, which is often when patients are already at home and no longer receiving close observation, which is why it's so important to have close po postpartum follow-up for all cardiac patients. Next. So this is just a summary of what we've discussed so far before we move on to the next objective. So as, we, as I already said, in pregnancy, preload goes up, stroke volume goes up, heart rate goes up, and cardiac output goes up, although we talked about how that can also drop during labor. And then um, the afterload or the systematic vascular resistance goes down. All right, next. So next, I'll move on to a brief overview of what happens in pregnancy when normal physiology becomes challenged by abnormal cardiac structure or function, i.e., what does pregnancy look like for those who have known congenital or acquired heart disease? We know these patients face higher risks during pregnancy, but what are those risks and how can an understanding of basic pregnancy physiology be helpful in their management? So next. So functional status for patients with cardiac disease is commonly classified according to the New York Heart Association classification system. While well, the New York Heart Association classification system isn't specific to any particular cardiac lesion or acquired heart disease, it is one way to obtain a general sense of how well a patient is functioning prior to pregnancy. 
In general, most patients who start the pregnancy at NYHA class one or two will tolerate pregnancy well and can expect a favorable outcome. While patients who start the pregnancy at NYHA class three or four are advised against pregnancy, since poor functional status at the beginning of pregnancy often predicts a poor outcome. Since as we've learned, pregnancy places a huge physiologic strain on the heart. Therefore, it is important to get a baseline functional status of all cardiac patients during either their preconception visit or at their first prenatal visit, since even women with normal hearts will notice significant changes in their functioning over the course of a pregnancy. So while it's not a perfect tool to help to use in pregnancy, and it wasn't designed to be used in pregnancy, at least some sort of serial assessment of a patient's functional status can be help, a helpful way to track a single patient's functional status over time, especially in patients who are not very active at baseline. Okay, next. I introduced the New York Heart Association and Functional Status as a precursor to the WHO guidelines on the management of cardiovascular diseases in pregnancy. These guidelines were first published in 2011 and often referred to as just the WHO guidelines. These are guidelines meant to help clinicians counsel and management pa manage patients with cardiac disease. Next. The WHO guidelines synthesized two earlier cardiac classification studies, CARPREG and Zahara, as well as other studies pulled from PubMed covering a 20-year span. Unlike earlier guidelines, cardiac risk is stratified into more general terms and include patients with both congenital and acquired cardiac disease. The WHO guidelines are now felt to be better predictive of outcomes in patients with congenital heart disease and more comprehensive than the earlier systems, although clinicians should be aware that risk counseling should still be individualized to each specific patient taking into account their specific lesion, current functional status on or off medications, and their history. I think future talks in this series will likely go into more detail on some of these specific lesions. I just bring this up as I plan to use one or two of these conditions to show how a strong understanding of normal pregnancy physiology can help guide management when things become abnormal. All right, next. So moving on to event risk and general pre um, pregnancy management principles, next. I included the next two slides because I wanted to give you some idea of where the concept of event risk came from and what we mean by that. While the details of these studies are not as important, I think it is worth mentioning the general concepts of a cardiac event risk using the CARPREG study for context. While CARPREG might not have been the first study to look at outcomes in pregnant people with cardiac disease, it is considered one of the landmark trials that really help people think about what happens to people with underlying cardiac disease during pregnancy. So CARPREG, which was short for cardiac disease in pregnancy, was a prospective um, study of 546 pregnant people in Canada that all had some sort of heart disease. The majority were congenital patients. The CARPREG group tracked the outcomes of 599 pregnancies from 1994 to 1999 and used this data to create the CARPREG scoring system. Next. The CARPREG authors first had to decide what defined a cardiac event. And so I'm not sure this probably comes from cardiology literature, but the CARPREG authors defined a cardiac event as pulmonary edema, either as diagnosed by chest x-ray or crackles on physical exam, the development of sustained tachyarrhythmia or bradyarrhythmia requiring treatment, stroke, cardiac arrest, or cardiac death. Using these criteria, the authors found that a primary cardiac event occurred in 80 completed pregnancies, or in about 13% of the cohort, with about 55% of these events occurring in the interpartum period. I find that interesting mostly to think about that only 55% occurred in the antepartum period, which means only, almost half of these cardiac events are happening in the postpartum period, which is important because as we talked about, the cardiovascular changes that we see in pregnancy can persist up to a year afterwards. And so it's likely that a lot of patients who have cardiac events are not actually being seen by OBGYNs, but instead by either our internal medicine, family practice, or um, ER um, providers. All right, next. The authors then further stratified their data to look for predictor of these cardiac events and found that the following four risk factors were predictive. A history of a prior cardiac event, um, New York Heart um, Association class three or four or hypoxemia um, at rest, left outflow tract obstruction or left ventricular ejection fraction less than 40%. Next. And finally, using their cohort, the CARPREG authors then came up with a scoring system whereby if a particular patient had none of these risk factors, they would be given a baseline risk of 5% of sustaining a cardiac event during pregnancy, whereas if they had one risk factor, their risk of a cardiac event rose to 27%. If they had more than one risk factor, their risk for a cardiac event jumped to 
As I mentioned earlier, while I think most clinicians prefer the WHO classification system to help guide counseling, the CARPREG studies, um, there was two of them, CARPREG-2 came um, as an expanded cohort several years later from the same group, raised two important points. One, it helped clinicians identify which cardiac patients face the highest risk during pregnancy. And two, as I said before, the majority of the cardiac events actually did happen in the antepartum period. 45% were occurring postpartum, likely due to the large fluid shifts that occur during that period. And as I said before, it's important to include ER or urgent care providers, um, as well as internal medicine and family practice providers, because these, they are more likely to see these patients in some ways than the OBGYNs. All right, next. The next few slides cover some general principles to keep in mind when creating a management from cardiac patients. I apologize for the busy slides, but I'll try to focus you on the highlights. The main points are that it is important to establish a baseline for each cardiac patient in the first trimester or whenever that patient first presents. It's always important to determine baseline functional status, either using the New York Heart Classification System or just asking basic questions about how active someone is or isn't, how well they are able to walk in from the parking lot, for example, how many pillows they sleep on at night, if they have any lower extremity edema when they take off their socks, that ba really basic stuff. And then also to get a baseline echocardiogram. Some of these things are more specific to different types of cardiac patients. For example, um, hepatitis C screening. I think we now, you know, ACOG recommends universal hepatitis C screening, but especially in patients who are congenital heart patients who had surgical repairs in infancy or childhood, because they often were at high risk for re receiving a blood transfusion before um, blood was routinely screened for hepatitis. So it's just little things like that. But almost all cardiac patients should have a thorough reassessment by cardiology in the third trimester which as I discussed earlier, is a time when plasma volume peaks and therefore represents the point at which the heart is likely under the most stress. An anesthesia consult is also important for all cardiac patients in the third trimester, as that will give everyone an L&D apple time to assess what type of monitoring will be needed for that individual patient, whether they will need arterial lines, telemetry, et cetera, and what staffing will be needed in order to provide that monitoring, because even at the hospital I work at, we don't have nurses that are comfortable with arterial lines, and so that kind of helps you decide if you need to send the patient to the cardiac ICU postpartum. So all of, I mean, anesthesia is important always, but it's also really important for planning. And it's important to say that not all patients will need all of these things. It can be individualized, but these are just things to think about. For example, genetic screening is important for patients with some sort of um, cardiomyopathy because a lot of those tend to be genetic, whereas other types of you know, patients may not, that might not be as important, that kind of thing. All right, next. Okay, so then we come to the intrapartum and postpartum period. Um, so as I said before, while the type of cardiac disease and the patient's functional status will ultimately drive the plan, here are a couple of things to consider. Because of the large fluid shifts that occur immediately postpartum, the intrapartum and postpartum periods are times of high risk for arrhythmias and pulmonary edema. So telemetry and strict eyes and nose on L&D are often recommended. Some cardiac patients will also require endocarditis prophylaxis, invasive blood pressure and monitoring, and or an assisted second stage, but rarely will patients require a cesarean delivery for the indication of cardiac disease alone. I think many people instinctively feel a cesarean delivery is better for all cardiac patients, but as we move on to our clinical case, I hope you to convince you that's not necessarily the case. Okay, moving on. So finally, since I think we all learn better when information is put into context, I put together a clinical case to help illustrate the role physiology plays in creating appropriate delivery plans. All right, next. So this is a somewhat fictional patient, <laughs> patient TP. Um, she is a 43-year-old G3P1. She is now at 37 and 0 with a history of aortic stenosis with an echo showing an ejection fraction of 65%, moderate concentric um, left ventricular hypertrophy with severe diastolic dysfunction, a heavily calcified aortic valve, and then critical aortic stenosis with a peak gradient of 141 milligram, uh, millimeters mercury and AV valve of 0.61 centimeters squared. It's not so important, those measurements, just know that it's severe. And aortic stenosis comes in three flavors, mild, moderate, severe. We're talking about the most severe to kind of help illustrate the point. All right, so let's think about how patient TP is going to do. So when we think about how pregnancy physiology drives morbidity associated with stenotic lesions, it mostly comes down to preload. 
So in stenotic lesions, the physiologic increase in preload that occurs from the increased volume of pregnancy leads to a lot of fluid being pushed up against a small space. And this fluid backup can then lead to pulmonary edema in cases of left-sided lesions, so mitral aortic stenosis, and peripheral edema in cases of right-sided lesions, such as polonic stenosis. This increase in volume, ex again, explains why many patients will start to decompensate around that 32-week mark when volume is reaching its peak and why it makes sense to repeat a patient's echocardiogram at 32 weeks. Because while a patient may have started the pregnancy with only mild to moderate, um, stenosis, the increase in volume means there's more pressure against the valve and the gradients go up. And so now you might have severe aortic stenosis. Next. Um, so while all this fluid backup can lead to increased atrial and ventricular stretch, this can then cause arrhythmias. The best way how it is explained to me by a cardiologist is that if you think about if you stretch the walls, the wiring goes haywire. And that's kind of what we see with people who end up getting more frequent arrhythmias in pregnancy. As their volume status goes up, their heart, because it's abnormal, the wiring goes crazy, they end up with arrhythmias. Um, so if these patients are prone to fluid overload at baseline, and we know postpartum periods lead to yet more volume increase, wouldn't it just make sense to keep them very dry during labor with diuretics and fluid restriction? Well, that intuitively seems to be the right answer. The problem is when the valvular stenosis becomes very severe, the heart may have trouble maintaining cardiac output because it has a fixed outflow obstruction. And so only so much blood can be pushed out with each contraction of the heart. Therefore, these patients are said to be preload dependent, since without enough preload, cardiac output then drops, <clears throat> and so too will tissue perfusion. And if you remember back to your very first anatomy class, some of the very first thing the heart perfuses after leaving the left ventricle are the coronary arteries. And unfortunately, those tend to be kind of important. They don't get perfused. That can lead to all kinds of unfortunate events, including cardiac ischemia, which then can lead to a massive MI or a fatal arrhythmia. Next. Therefore, in patients that are preload dependent, anything that drops preload quickly is a problem. So while things like prolonged valsalva or hypotension from blood loss or an epidural will cause cardiac, a drop of cardiac output, so will things like tachycardia from pain or tibutaline administration because they decrease the time the heart has to fill and then thus, thus decreases the preload. These factors are part of the reason why many patients with severe aortic or mitral stenosis need early slow epidurals, early to avoid tachycardia from pain, but slow to avoid big drops in blood pressure. Preload dependent patients may also need assisted second stages to minimize valsalva time, although some of that may be individualized, taking into account the patient's parity and functional status. And finally, as mentioned before, for patients um, at high risk for cardiac events, it is tempting to believe a C-section will be the safer op option. But remember, C-sections come with significantly larger fluid shifts with greater blood loss, and so they may not actually be the best option for the patient. The box at the bottom of the slide summarizes some of these considerations and alludes to the importance of strict eyes and O's and careful fluid management in these patients. As we discussed, patients who are fluid overloaded are at risk of arrhythmias and flash pulmonary edema, but in preload dependent patients, those that are too dry are at risk for ischemia and MMI if their cardiac output drops too much. Therefore, while neither option is good, it is generally better to keep these patients slightly more wet than dry, because while pulmonary edema is not great, hypovolemia and decreased venous return can kill the patient quickly. I know all of this probably seems very complicated. It's just a problem of physiology. And while your anesthesia and cardiology colleagues can help guide some aspects of the management, I think OBs have a role in helping them think about the unique changes in physiology associated with each stage of pregnancy. So I was gonna leave it there. So I'll, next, the last slide. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, the next slide, yeah, yeah. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I put my email at the bottom there. So if anyone has any specific questions, otherwise you can unmute yourself or I can check the chat. Oops. Thank you so much, Dr. Judy. That was a great presentation. I appreciate that. So I'm going into the chat right now. Um, doesn't appear to be anything. So I'll just encourage anybody to put their questions in the chat. Um, and um, if you are joining via phone, please feel free to um, ask your question, unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah. And I know it looks like we don't have any questions right now. I know that was a really robust presentation, <laughs> a lot to digest with that. Um, 
And I guess I, I might turn it over to um, our clinical leads on the Gap QC side. If there's any thoughts, uh, you know, in, in regards to the bundle and 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 you know implementation here, I'll I'll hand it over to um, anybody who's uh, wants to chime in on the clinical aspects of this. This is Missy Kotke. Um, thank you so much. Uh, that was amazing. And I have a lot of questions that came up for me, but the here's one that I think is um, just, I just don't know the answer. Um, is there information for patients out there? You know, I'm thinking about kind of that special, like kind of sweet spot that you described in your clinical case that kind of goes over, like, if this is your lesion or if you are like, do patients, is there any kind of communication to patients of what preload dependent means and like why the balance is important. And even like, and I'm thinking of like cartoon videos, things like nothing too much, but like just to like, hey, for you in labor, here are the things that we're all balancing. Here's what's gonna be important to you. And then super important because I think collectively as a field, um, like it's like baby out, high five, everybody everybody gets <laughs> dropped off in the middle of nowhere and like good luck with that but like thinking um for the people who are going to be at increased risk for being able to you know manage and compensate those big shifts postpartum i'm just you know part of what lisa talked about at the beginning of the uh hour is that we've been working on some patient screening tools that I, i'm not crazy about that word, but like patient information about like what you should be aware of, but they don't, I, they don't give any why, right? Like they're like, Hey, if you're sleeping up on four pillows, that's problematic. Or, Hey, <laughs> your shortness of breath, you know, like you should go into the ER, but there's, I, I, I haven't seen any patient facing things that even, you know, not a, a deep dive where they need to have a medical degree or advanced training, but where they could be like, Oh, I understand that, you know, cause to some extent, it's a pump, you know, and, and lots of people can understand pumps. So long, winding question, but just curious about that. Uh, I don't know of anything. Like, I know ICOG often puts, like, patient information together. I don't know that they've, because the, I think the two things, I think it's hard because some of this information is specific to congenital cardiac patients. So, like, CHOP had really good handouts on their website about different cardiac lesions that are like very simple, clear diagrams that you can die. Like if someone has tetralogy of flow, that's not something and like, I certainly didn't know anything about that before I was a fellow. So like, I would have to go to CHOP's website, download their like graphic of tetralogy of flow. But I don't think as far as I know that I've seen any patient information where it sort of takes the general, like, this is your heart. This is what happens in pregnancy. These are the warning signs. But I, I don't know if Iris has seen anything but I don't know of any other patient information other than the stuff we used to get off the CHOP website. But it would be a good tool. Yeah, and right. I, I, I think that's part of the cardiac bundle to provide, to develop patient and both patient and provider information. We've really focused on the provider thus far, um, although I think we're working on some warning signs, right, Missy, with the students that were interested. Mm -hmm. And then in Florida, Wash, Washington Hill, who's an MFM there, I guess he's retired now, but he was chair of uh, Florida's Maternal Mortality Review Committee for a while. They developed these nice index size cards. I guess the print was probably pretty small, but they handed out to patients being discharged from uh, the hospital postpartum or, you know, from labor and delivery or APU about warning signs that they were to come back in for. And from what I understand from the group in Florida, they it was a very robust review of those signs by nursing staff when each patient was discharged. Um, and their their card had numbers to call and it had printed on it it's the patient's diagnosis, like she was in for preeclampsia or you know, whatever. Uh, so that if she had to present to a hospital, there would be some basic information to the providers that may or may not have been familiar with uh, that particular patient. So it's, you know, it's really, we found from the Maternal Mortality Review Committee, it's pretty hard to get patients uh, in some cases to attend to that information that is provided for them. And when we've talked to family members uh, of patients who have died, they, you know, they'll tell us, 
yes, she her she knew her chest was hurting. She knew that was probably going to be bad, but she had to go do this, and she couldn't get to the hospital. She couldn't get an Uber to come pick her up. Just a lot of reasons that keep them from presenting. So I think we have some work to do in Georgia in terms of developing some good tools that are appropriate for patients, you know, of a variety of um, educational backgrounds and levels of understanding. So I guess that's in the future for us. Yeah, and I would encourage anybody on the call that um, in your facilities, if you're using anything specific um, to please send it along, um, sharing is caring and we definitely don't want to reinvent the wheel and, and want to showcase anything that's working well at your facility. So um, definitely feel free to share those with me. Um, you can certainly upload directly to the Microsoft Teams channel. Um, we do have quite a bit of resources already um, going on there right now as our cardiac conditions repository. Um, so uh, yes, uh, please feel free to share if there's anything um, you want to spread um, to the rest of the group. Any other questions? All right. Well, I think we're going to get some time back in our day, um, and that's always appreciated. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Duty. That was amazing. Um, Dr. Krishna, you are, your help on all of this and getting this organized and coordinated is so welcomed and appreciated. Um, and um, Dr. Ellis, we thank you for um, connecting all of us and this great work. So please, if you have not enrolled in the Cardiac Initiative, um, because maybe you're waiting on getting your multidisciplinary team and the champions assigned, um, please go ahead and just complete the um, enrollment form. And then we'll, with the understanding that you're going to be building your team and the back end, just so we have an idea of you know baseline data and what we need to pull. But again, we are focusing on the readiness portion of this bundle. We are not going to boil the ocean all at once and so um, if you're on the fence with that we we want to make sure that we you know we are taking this as slow as we need to go um, really focusing on these foundational um, cardiac education sessions um, and then moving um, you know intervention by intervention starting in the readiness section so we know everybody's at different levels um, and just appreciate you all and your continued support of the gap qc and reach out with any questions about the initiative and for those that are already enrolled, look out for an email from us to set up your onboarding call. So thanks, Lisa, everyone. Lisa, Dr. Bird put a comment in about where will this recording be located? Did I miss that? Yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. We will post all of this on the Microsoft Teams channel um, for the, everybody should have access um, who is part of the GAP QC. I'm also going to send out an email um, after this um, present uh, after today and with all of that, as well as um, information about tomorrow's uh, grand round session with Dr. Hamid. And thank you, Iris and Dr. Dady. Really appreciate your involvement today and hope you'll be willing to continue to be involved in the future. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thanks everyone for joining today. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.